Welcome to Beneath the Bible, where we're helping you dig deeper and uncover the world beneath the sacred book. Now, a few weeks ago, we looked at the Moabites in the Bible and archaeology. The Moabites were neighbors and frequent antagonists of ancient Israel, though they were also distant relatives according to Genesis. You can check that video out here if you haven't already. Now, in that video, we talked about the reign of a Moabite king named Mesha, who united a disparate group of people into a polity known as Moab. We have a record of Mesha's reign on an artifact called the Mesha Stella. We talked about this artifact some in the previous video, but it's worth further exploration. So let's take an artifact deep dive into the Mesha Stella. This is the Moabite stone, or the Mesha Stella. It measures around 115 centimeters tall, it's about 60 centimeters wide and 60 centimeters thick. On it is preserved a 34 line inscription. There's some ongoing debates about how to best translate and understand that inscription for reasons we'll see in just a minute. It's currently on display in the Louvre in Paris if you want to go see it. The stella itself has a very interesting story of discovery, and that story will have some bearing on how we understand the stone, so it's worth going into in some detail. Plus, it's kind of a fun story. The stone was apparently known amongst members of the Beni Hamada Bedouin in Jordan for some time. The stone only came to the attention of Western scholars in 1868, when Frederick Klein, who was an Anglican missionary, was traveling through Ottoman-controlled Transjordan, or what's now the country of Jordan. He was with the son of the Sheikh of the Bani Sakr clan, a clan that had recently allied with the Bani Hamada, and this son of the Sheikh was serving as his guard. While camping at a seasonally occupied camp at Zibon, the Bedouin offered to show Klein a stone no European had seen. They took him to a partially buried stone, what is now known as the Mesha Stella. And while neither could read the text, everyone knew it was significant. Klein copied a bit of the text, and when he was next in Jerusalem, he showed it to a German consul there. This began a year-long struggle between the Germans, French, and British to gain control of the stone. Now, some of these stories are really quite interesting. They involve Bedouin clan conflicts and power relations and European and Ottoman colonial dynamics, and it's all a bit messy, but it's really interesting. If you want to get into all of it, we'll link a book in the description that discusses it in greater detail. But one of my favorite stories is that when the Germans negotiated to purchase the stone, one clan refused because they believed the stone was the shrine of a jinn, and any tracing of the stone would rob it of its power. They also wanted four times the price that was offered for the stone. You know, the stone may house a potentially vengeful spirit, but cash is king, you know? Understandably, the Europeans did not appreciate the response. So negotiations broke down between the Bedouin clans and the Germans, who then sought the help of their allies, the Ottomans. As those neg negotiations broke down, word got out, and the noted French archaeologist Charles Clermont Gonneau had a Bedouin from a different clan make a squeeze of the entire inscription. So a squeeze is a kind of paper mache plaster that takes an impression of the artifact, and in this case, the inscribed text. This clandestine mission is one of those folk tales in archaeology. Uh, lots of different stories exist about how the squeeze was taken, but the truth of it is unfortunately likely lost to history. What we do know was that while the squeeze was being taken, some men of the Beni Hamada clan arrived and they were not happy with the stone uh, being messed with. Harsh words escalated to physical struggle, and that escalated until someone was actually shot. Amid the confusion, one man grabbed the squeeze, which had not entirely set, and the torn pieces of it were taken back to Jerusalem. Shortly thereafter, an Ottoman official from Nablus came to the Bani Hamada and demanded the stone. The Bedouin of Transjordan had no love for the Ottomans, particularly after being the target of a milita military campaign a few years before, and so they refused. The Europeans were at least offering cash. The Bani Hamada could not imagine why this black rock with scratches on it was so valuable. They assumed its value must be on the inside, so they took the stone, heated it over a fire, and dropped it in a vat of water. They did this over and over until the stone shattered, but they found no gold or anything else of value inside. So the fragments were distributed to members of the clan, and they were hidden from the Europeans and the Ottomans. The Beni Hamada just wanted to be left alone, which is something I can appreciate. They didn't ask to be involved in the struggle between colonial powers trying to take their treasured possessions. But we have the Mesha Stella reconstructed intact today, so how did that happen? Over time, the British archaeologist Charles Warren gathered some of these hidden pieces, and when he left Palestine, he gave them to none other than Charles Claremont Gonneau, who then collected several more pieces on his own. Those pieces were put together with the help of the squeeze he had taken, and the rest of the monument was reconstructed from the squeeze. So what you see today is that reconstructed stone. 
The brownish, rough-looking bits are the original basalt stella that was cracked, and the smoother black stone is the reconstruction from the squeeze Claremont Gounod had taken. You can see why there may be some debates around how to translate the inscription. Now, even in perfectly preserved texts, there are debates about how to understand what the text is saying, let alone when the text has gone through as much as this one has. Even still, the debates are mostly over esoteric points at this stage, and we can be pretty confident in what it says. So, what does it say? Let's take a closer look at the Stella. The script is similar to that of a Paleo-Hebrew or Phoenician, but is, in, but is in this case in the Moabite language. But the Meshach Stella is actually so close to Hebrew in, in its grammar that some people consider it a dialect of Hebrew at this stage. So here's what it says, more or less. We're using Bruce Rutledge's translation here. Uh, we aren't going to take time to read it all. But if you want to pause the video here or come back to this point, you can read what it says. You can also find a different translation online. There are a lot of them out there. But not all translations will be exactly the same, and there are some different opinions on how to deal with certain issues in the text. Now, to summarize, this is a monumental inscription that details the rise to power of Mesha, son of Kamoshia, from local strongman of Dubon to liberator and self-styled king of Moab. It is, to date, the longest historical narrative text ever discovered in the Iron Age Levant. It tells how Mesha came to power and asserted control over what may be called Moabite territory, north and south of the Arnon. In the account, Mesha tells how Omri had oppressed the land of Moab and occupied the land around Madaba, and he had supported the Gadites in Atarot. The text says Omri's son likewise oppressed Moab. That would be the biblical king Ahab. Mesha claims this is because the national god of Moab, Chemosh, was angry with Moab, and he allowed this oppression to occur. But Mesha says that in his day, Chemosh spoke and he gave Mesha victory over the house of Omri, that is the kingdom of Israel. Mesha describes how he defeated Israel and plundered the cities and killed the people. It even mentions how he took the rams of Yahweh from Nebo. Mesha also talks about how he built up various places in Moab, including what he calls the Karho, which is likely a district in Dibon, maybe a citadel or a cult site. It's also likely that this is where the original stone was found, this is where it was originally placed and is where it was found. Mesha further recounts how he built other cities and repopulated them with loyal Moabites. After describing his construction accomplishments in northern Moab, he talks about a conquest to the south in Haronan. There, he defeated an entity called This. This name may be translated either as the House of Deodo, presumably a local tribe or clan within Moab, some kind of local ruling family, or it may be translated as House of David, referring to the kingdom of Judah. If the latter is the correct reading, then this would be the earliest extra-biblical reference to Judah. Haronan is in the south of Moab, to the west of Karak, and north of the Wadi Hasa, near the border of Edom. There is no reference to Edom in the text, and this possible reference to the kingdom of Judah is curious, as Judah never directly controlled this site. However, Edom, as Judah's vassal, may have controlled it, which may be why the house of David would be mentioned. But this leads to some issues in the interpretation of the text. We have this text as it stands, and no one questions the authenticity of the text anymore. The text is damaged, given its recent history, and so some letters are debated, and how those letters change uh, can change the translation, sometimes quite dramatically. Even within the text now, there are issues of interpretation, and some of these are really interesting issues to dive into. And we should note that this text has particular theological and political agendas. It is conforming to particular patterns of monumental royal inscriptions. The Tel Dan Stella is of the same genre and dates to only a few years after the Mesha Stella. Not of Naaman has noted that these inscriptions both seem to point to past aggression from neighbors as a pretext for the current aggression of the narrator. Further, that aggression from a ruthless neighbor is pushed back into the time of the father, a father who is a legitimate king and definitely not an upstart usurper, by the way. In the Mesha Stella, Mesha is responding to the oppression of the house of Omri, so he is justified in his rebellion. Mesha is restoring the status quo ante and possibly taking a few extra towns as interest. We should see this justification as a rhetorical device and not necessarily a historical fact. As a rhetorical device, we see the prior failings of the father extol the virtues of the son, the legitimate heir and king, who is totally justified in his response to the aggression he inherited. So there are clearly some rhetorical devices at play here that may trump the concerns of historicity. But that certainly doesn't mean there is no historicity or anything we can learn about Mesha or Moab from this text. The text does reveal important things about Moabite social structure. It has bearing on how the Moabite people related to non-Moabite people, possibly including Israelite tribes like Gad and Reuben. It may allude to sub-state Moabite socio-political units. 
It claims Mesha was king of Moab, but then records him essentially conquering all of Moab. So it's not clear how the claims in this stella should be understood. There's a lot that is in this text and it's intriguing and difficult to understand on its own. And compounding these issues, we have another account from across the Jordan that seems to record the aftermath or even the events at the end of this inscription. The Mesha Stella and the Bible both record the same event, Mesha's rebellion against Israel. The biblical account is in 2 Kings chapter 3. Now, while both sources tell about Mesha's rebellion, they differ on a number of details, notably the timing of the stories. But some of that's a matter of emphasis and not of historicity. And for some background, 2 Kings 1 gives some context that after Ahab son of Omri died, Moab rebelled. It seems that this is the initial rebellion of Mesha. He rebelled in the short reign of Ahaziah, drove out the Israelite forces, and began fortifying the northern part of Moab. In 2 Kings 3, we read about Israel's ultimate response to this rebellion after Joram, or Jehoram, became king of Israel. Joram was the brother of the prior king of Israel, Ahaziah, and both were sons of Ahab. The text of 2 Kings 3 is interesting because it goes from the royal narrative to an interesting prophetic story that seems to go back and tell about the start of Mesha's rebellion, saying that Mesha the king of Moab raised sheep. He had a large tribute he owed to the king of Israel, but after Ahab died, he quit paying the tribute, which is tantamount to rebellion. This would have occurred sometime around 850 BC, give or take a few years. Now, so far, this is in line with the Mesha Stella. The house of Omri oppressed Moab and was essentially in control of at least the northern part of Moab. This is attested in both the Mesha Stella and the biblical text. Mesha doesn't give any battle details, only that he was victorious over the house of Omri and went on to fortify many sites north of the Arnon. The account in Kings seems to be set sometime after this and continues to detail the battle plan in response to Mesha's rebellion. Joram consults Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, and asks for assistance to fight Mesha. Now, this should not be seen as a friendly, hey, it'd be great if you could help me out in a pinch here kind of ask. Israel was the dominant power in the southern Levant at the time, and states like Judah, Edom, and formerly Moab were essentially vassals of Israel. Jehoshaphat was obligated to say he would help, and he does. So the kings of Israel and Judah, along with the king of Edom, set off to fight Mesha. They decided on a southern route against Mesha and crossed through Edom into southern Moab. This could be because that they wanted to travel through friendly territory for as long as possible. Or it could be that Mesha had fortified the Mishor and Arnon, essentially blocking off the northern route, as he describes in the Mesha Stella. Why they take the southern route isn't mentioned, but the Mesha Stella may fill in those gaps. As the armies march toward Edom, they run out of water and end up consulting the prophet Elisha as to how to get out of this mess. Joram falsely blames the whole debacle on Yahweh, so he wants a Yahwistic prophet to give him a solution. After some sarcastic back and forth, Elisha gives an oracle from God where he promises both water as well as victory over Moab. And not only victory, but total victory even to the point of going against the rules of war stated in Deuteronomy. This is taken as good news, and the next day, Elisha's promised water arrives. The wadi was filled with water without any storm or wind bringing it. The Moabite soldiers see the water with the way that the sun hits it, and they think that it's blood. They assume the armies of the three kings had an internal quarrel and fought amongst themselves. They leave their positions and attack Israel, who fights back ultimately emerging victorious over Moab. The text fast forwards a bit to the coalition forces defeating Moab, all the way back to a single city, Kir Haraset, likely the city of Karak, which they put under siege. Things are looking good for the Israelite coalition. Elisha's promise of victory is looking like it's going to come true. Just one more city to go, and the slingers are striking the city itself. But then things get complicated. The text is somewhat ambiguous here. There are places where it isn't clear what's going on, and there are a few valid interpretations. Mesha sees that things aren't going well, and he takes 700 swordsmen. If that number is accurate, and not a generic term for a battalion or a squadron, then that is a large force. And he tries to break through to the king of Edom. Is this because he thought the king of Edom was the weakest force, and he thought he could break through the lines and escape? 
Is it because he thought he may be able to get the king of Edom to turn and help him? It's not clear why he does this or why this detail is included, but it doesn't work and Mesha can't break through. So he returns to the city and does something reprehensible. He takes his firstborn son, his heir, and he sacrifices him on the city wall. The word used is Olah, clearly meaning a burnt offering. The deity to whom Mesha makes the sacrifice is not explicitly stated. Everywhere else, the Moabite national deity is recognized as Chemosh, and most interpreters assume this is the one to whom the sacrifice is devoted, but that isn't stated in the text. Then we read that a great wrath was against Israel and they departed to their own land. So in the end, the Mesha Stella and the text of 2 Kings have some disagreements, but if this harmonization we just went through is accurate, then the two ultimately land in the same spot as far as the historical ending. Mesha rebelled, Mesha was seemingly victorious, Moab gained independence from Israel. Mesha attributes this victory to Chemosh, while the Bible is more ambiguous on this point. Both texts have ideological agendas, but their understanding of history is actually quite similar. To Mesha, Chemosh is in charge of all things. He allowed Israel to punish Moab because he was angry with the land, but he changed his mind and allowed Mesha to be victorious in the end. In the Bible, we see similar theological assumptions as to what is seen in the Mesha Stella, but with Yahweh, not Chemosh, in charge. So, what can we say about the Mesha Stella and its usefulness for understanding the Bible? Well, there are a few things that we want to point out. One is the way that the Bible and the Mesha Stella corroborate one another on many historical points. They describe the same events with many of the same details, but of course they differ in how they interpret these events. It's notable, however, that there are some interesting parallels between the Mesha Stella and the Bible in terms of the language and theological ideas around warfare and the national deity. Ancient peoples understood their deities to be intimately involved in warfare, and many people groups in the Southern Levant shared similar ideas about how their deity fought alongside them in war. The way Mesha talks about Chemosh would have been quite familiar to readers of the Bible. We're planning to cover the theology of warfare in the ancient Near East in a future video, so be sure to stay tuned for that. The bigger questions we're left with surround Mesha's sacrifice of his son and its relationship to the fulfillment, or lack thereof, of Elisha's prophecy. This act is unthinkable to us, and furthermore, it's in direct opposition to the practice of Yahweh worship, which resoundingly forbids human sacrifice. And yet the sacrifice seems to work. It seems to have the effect of driving away the Israelite coalition, preserving the last Moabite stronghold, and securing Moab's independence. Upon seeing it, the Israelites suddenly turn around and go home, rather than completing the destruction of Moab. So the end of this story is very ambiguous. Does Mesha rouse Chemosh to action with the great sacrifice of his son, and Chemosh drives Israel away? Does he even sacrifice to Chemosh, or is it to Yahweh? Does Yahweh's wrath turn against Israel? What does this wrath even mean? Now, some think it may be a kind of pestilence that was commonly part of siege warfare in the ancient world. Such a pestilence could certainly be seen as divine wrath. But from where exactly? The text isn't clear. It's even less clear how we handle this detail with the promise Elisha gave the coalition of kings, because it seems that the victory in Moab is not completed. Later in Kings, Moab is independent. The prophets Isaiah and Jeremiah recognize an independent and expanded Moab as well. So what do we make of all this? Well, we were going to answer that question in this video, but as we dug into it, we realized it really deserves its own treatment. Understanding Mesha's sacrifice is also beyond the scope of this video, because the Mesha Stella doesn't record that event. So for now, we'll leave you with the ambiguity of the ending of this story, and we'll be back next week for a deep dive on Mesha's sacrifice and how to understand it. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss it. Thanks for joining us for this Beneath the Bible video. If you're interested in learning more about this topic, we've included some references and resources in the description below. If you enjoyed this video and you want to see more content like it, be sure to subscribe and check out our overview of the Moabites or our artifact deep dive on the Ta'anak cult stand. You can also check out our website, BeneathTheBible.com, and follow us on social media at Beneath the Bible. If you learned something new today, take a minute to share this video with your friends. Until next time, keep digging.